Okay. So you don't have to turn there yet, but if you'd like to, you can. Uh, but for most of this morning, in fact, for all of this morning, really, we're going to be actually spending all of our time in one chunk of Scripture. Um, this is what we'd call an expositional sermon, uh, and to a degree, um, and not an exegetical sermon. I mean, it, it is, but not exclusively, okay? Um, I'm not going to talk more about that because it's not relevant. But what that means is you just need to turn to one place today if you'd like. It'll also be up here, so don't worry about that. But if you'd like to read along with me, we will be spending our time in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Okay, that's where we're going to be spending the bulk of our time this morning. So feel free to turn there if you'd like. But like I said, it's also on the screen. You can use your phone. If you brought your Bible today, that's great too. These are all great ways to take in the text. And I have to confess with you, um, I, I was really torn about which direction to take this sermon on, because when it comes to the topic of offerings and tithes and, say, this idea of sacrifices, I mean, honestly, it, it could be its own series, really. And so my goal today is to talk about how a proper approach to all three of these things can be found in 2 Corinthians 8 when we're talking about giving specifically. Okay, so I'm going to kind of break these down for you really quickly. In church, we have three words that we'll sometimes use mistakenly interchangeably <laughs> to describe different practices in both the church and in Israel prior to the church, and really in Israel to this modern day. And by Israel, I mean people who practice Orthodox Judaic faith. Um, but we have these three words. I'm going to break them down for you rather quickly because it's not where I want to spend the bulk of my time this morning. You with me so far? Okay, great. Uh, so a tithe is related to, the, uh, to related to this idea of a tenth, right? So in the Old Testament, in Leviticus and in other places, Israel was given the commandment to tithe 10% and also marks the first 10% of their agricultural goods to be given to the Levitical class, or the, Levitic, the Levites, or the Levitical priests, okay? So for some of you, this will be new information or confusing. Again, not necessarily important for the crux of the topic we're talking about today, but that's how a tithe functioned, right? And Jesus himself actually references the tithe in the Gospels when he says, you know, um, you Pharisees, you take the tithe, but your heart's not in it. You know, you, you, you kind of have, you practice the tithe, quote-unquote, but it's not really important to you. Um, some scholars will say that Christians aren't supposed to tithe, that the tithe died with the Levitical class, as it were. Um, I am not a Levite. Um, I do not check several boxes that would allow me to be a Levite. <laughs> um, but that being said, we often talk about tithing in church and how a lot of our families will give 10% of their income as a gift to the church for the church to do what it needs to do, i.e. pay myself and Eddie, take care of the building, to do other ministry things. You know, when we have like men's group here and I bring some donuts or something, that money comes out of our general operating fund. And so people will say, I tithe 10% or more or less to the church as a regular discipline, right? An offering, however, or rather, you see where it says offering? Can you replace offering with giving? <laughs> Pastor Rob made a typo there. Um, that should say giving, not offerings. I apologize. Hey, 2024, hey? <laughs> um, so giving or being giving is distinct from tithing right so whatever your practice is regarding how you give to the church you are supposed to be giving right you see someone on the street that you feel like needs some help needs a, a big mac or something i'm not sure what the case might be how you can help them using good judgment you are, be, you are supposed to, if you're a Christian, be prepared to give. They ask you at the cash register, do you want to round up to the nearest dollar for cancer research? I'm not saying you should always have to, but it's worth considering. 
This idea of giving is this idea that I'm going to look, this is the, well, the concept we're going to explore the most this morning, so I don't want to talk too much about it now. But giving is this idea of whatever income you have, whatever blessings that you have been given by God, as we're thinking about Thanksgiving, you are to be freely giving outward from. Right? Someone that you love needs a loan. Maybe it shouldn't be a loan that you give them. Maybe it should be a gift. Maybe it should be a loan because you want them to learn something. I don't know. But, but giving, regardless, should be a general practice in Christian, Christian faith where we give radically, we give generously to all sorts of causes in this world that we support as well as individuals that are in need. And the third classification when we talk about this idea of giving is the idea of sacrifices, right? Now, I'm not going to go too deep into here because honestly, we don't have time. Um, but when we think of sacrifices, we can think of the Old Testament frame of the scapegoat, right? So where people would place their sins upon a goat and allow it to go into the wilderness where God's providence would either preserve it or slay it. But regardless, their sin was taken care of. You have days like the Day of Atonement, festivals built around taking the sin of the community and placing it off themselves. There's also individual sacrifices for animals and things like that. And then in the New Testament, we have one sacrifice for our sins, and that is Jesus Christ himself, right? That's the gospel. We all have sinned. The result of sin is death and alienation from those around us and from our God. But God, Christ himself, took on our sin. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become his righteousness, right? So that's the New Testament idea of what our sacrifice is. And we are to live sacrificially because Christ showed us how. So that's my sermon. Uh, worship team, come back up. And uh, we're good. Awesome. But how? <laughs> how do we do these things? Well, that's why we've turned to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So we're going to start with verse 1. We're going to think about this idea of giving radically, and are we supposed to? Right? Ooh, don't get excited. For some reason, there's sleigh bells in here. They're a little early. <laughs> I don't know why they're there. Come on. There we go. So, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 8. Before I begin, some context. <laughs> 2 Corinthians, the second of two remaining letters that we have that Paul the Apostle wrote to the Corinthian church. There was probably more. In fact, he references other letters in 1 and 2 Corinthians, but these are the two we have in our scriptures. And the Corinthian church was amazing, guys. If it helps you, like, picture the biggest church you can picture in Calgary, right? Maybe it's Center Street, maybe it's First Alliance, and I'm not, I'm not going to put them down, don't worry. Uh, they're fine churches. No, no beef, no little guy syndrome with them. They're great. Um, imagine a church like that, and you go to their services, and man, they're unreal. They're incredible. They got like lasers. Um, I don't know if these churches have lasers, but just imagine with me. They got lasers, and if you have lasers, anyone who knows anything about live performances know they also have smoke machines, right? We've got two subwoofers in here. It's pretty nice. Right? They've got like 15 subwoofers. It's like boom. Like it's like boom. You feel it in your soul. It's good. Um, that feeling when you walk past a concert venue and you're like boom, boom, boom. It's like, yeah, that's good. I love that. You know, they've got like the best preacher we ever heard. He's funny. He's good looking. He has all his hair. He's incredible. <laughs> and uh, they got a gym. And then when you go there, it's so amazing. Like people, like you see people like get healed. You see people like speak in tongues, right, and, and prophesy. They, 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 a guy wins a lottery ticket while he's there because someone figures out what the numbers are through the Holy Spirit. It's, an, it's incredible. And you go there, and let's say you go there for a little while. You go for like six months because it's incredible. And after the end of six months, you realize, I, I don't know anybody here. No, one, no one's ever said hi or, or welcomed me or shook my hand or wanted to get to know me at all. They don't pray for me. The, the pastor, he, he's cool, but like every time I try to like talk to him or email him, he's too busy. 
Like, he can't see me because he's doing the important work of writing and, and you know, rehearsing his sermon. He's got a backflip in this one this week. He's got to get the ropes and the safety measures in place. Yeah, it's incredible, but I don't feel very loved at this church. They don't put their lives down for each other, but they have all these other amazing things. That's the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is excelling in, in all these amazing ways. They're having amazing actions of the Spirit in their midst, but they don't love each other. In 1 Corinthians, um, we, we saw that their pride around their services and the Lord's table made it that poor people couldn't come to the Lord's table because the wealthy were keeping it for themselves and eating and the table, who, which is supposed to be for everyone, as we see in our centerpiece here with this bounty, is, is restricted to a few. And, and even worse, as they have these amazing, miraculous things, in their midst is terrible sinfulness, right? A form of incest is, is in their midst, and, and they don't care because they're doing incredible things. We're a great church because we've got amazing spiritual gifts, but they've forgotten how to love, and they've forgotten how to pursue Christ. And that's a weird dichotomy that puzzles our brains, because if you're like, if you're doing all these spiritual things, surely you're a good church, right? Well, not according to scriptures. These things are not evidences of a right heart. If I'm not careful, I'm going to preach the wrong sermon. So let's, let's get back to 2 Corinthians. This is a second letter that Paul has written to this church. He says this, Now we make known to you, brothers and sisters, the grace of God given to the churches of Macedonia, that during a severe ordeal of suffering, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. So we've got some dichotomies here. I'm going to break this down. So, context. Um, the, the, Jew, uh, the church, the Jewish Christians in Rome were enduring a famine, partly because food was scarce in Rome at that time, and the Christians, the Jewish Christians, they were anathema. The, the Jewish establishment didn't want them. The Roman establishment didn't want them because they worshipped the wrong gods. They did the wrong practice. They didn't sacrifice. And so when the food came around in Rome, the Jewish Christians were not able to eat. They were slaves. They were poor. They didn't have access to the social programs that a Roman citizen would have access to. And so Paul and his apostles, like Titus and his followers, not Paul the apostle and his followers, people like Titus and others, were, were taking up an offering on their, journey, on their journeys, givings, to take back to the Jewish Christians in Rome so that they could eat. Right? So it's like a Christian organization like Canadian Global Response or Baptist Global Response or something like that, you know, doing a fundraising effort for those that have been afflicted by the hurricanes, Right? It's kind of the same idea. So Paul's going around, he's asking for money to be sent with Titus to the Jewish Christians in Rome. That's the context. And so he uses as an example while talking to the Corinthians that the church in Macedonia, who going through it themselves, have managed to, from joy, and interestingly, from extreme poverty, to give generously. Think about that for a second. That's a theme we've talked about last week, and we're going to talk about this week a little bit, this idea of giving out of poverty. So Jesus became poor, and he gave out of his poverty. Right? So Paul is using this example to kind of inspire the Corinthian church and us with the Macedonians to say, you might not feel like you have anything to give, but you can now, I, I, I want to preface this, and we'll come back to it later, and, and Paul himself will do this in our text as we see. You are supposed to give out of what you have, okay? You're not supposed to go into debt in your giving to Pathway Church, or in your, your giving, you know, you get your paycheck, you cash it, and then you just, you know, put it in an envelope, and you find the first person you see and say, have my paycheck, <laughs> 
unless God has spoken incredibly clearly to you, you're, you're not supposed to do that. That's not meant to be the approach. But you are supposed to, with joy, abundant joy, even out of your poverty, be giving how you can. Okay? The verse continues. For I testify, I witness to, they gave according to their means and beyond their means. They did so voluntarily, begging us with great earnestness for the blessing and fellowship of helping the saints. Well, that caught my attention, verse 4, hey? Begging us. Like, Paul, don't leave. I have to give to the Jewish church in Rome. They need this. I have to give. Please take, take, take. Because they wanted to help their brothers and sisters. And they did just... They did this not just as we had hoped, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and to us by the will of God. These people had been transformed into a posture of utter givingness (laughs) where they begged, take more become full. We we want to help. I believe this teaches us that the gospel is meant to transform our giving. And it's it's hard in our culture because I think sometimes we might encounter like giving fatigue. You know, it feels like you can't check out of anywhere without somebody wanting your money. But sociologists have discovered that as week-in, week-out church numbers have declined in North America, benevolent giving, nonprofit giving, has also declined. It's not a one-to-one relationship, but the two trends are very similar. That's frightening to me. And I don't want to talk about going to why, but what that means is that there are great partners in our churches and in our communities that need help, church. So if you're a believer and you've been coming to church for a little while, this, this, this point specifically is for you. If you come to church every single week and and you believe in Jesus and you've been walking the walk for a long time and maybe you're at the point in your life where you're at the, you're actually making money, you know, you've finished college and you've, you know, you're chipping away at those student loans, but you've got some disposable income. When's the last time that you reassessed the work that Jesus has done in your heart and how that should reflect the work he's doing in your bank account? Right? And I'm talking to my young adults here this morning. I don't want to guilt you. I don't want, like, I know you're not loaded. <laughs> um, but part of your maturing work as you grow is to assess how do I give, where do I give, how do I do this responsibly, and in a way that is meant to be radical because my faith in Jesus is radical. And and if any of you feel uncomfortable this morning, like, oh, the pastor's talking about me giving him money, put yourself in my shoes. (laughs) This is is a sermon I've been putting off for, like, two years. Every time it comes up, I, I like, have Eddie do it, or last time it was Larry. Uh, (laughs) Because I struggle with talking about money, if I'm honest with you. It's it's hard for me to talk about. I think it's partly because it's an idol in my life. Um... And partly because I don't want you to think of me as like some money-grubbing so-and-so. But I also have to preach the text. And that's my first responsibility. So if you want to talk more about this, always happy to talk. But just know that if you're feeling a little queasy this morning, brothers and sisters, I'm right there with you. All right, let's keep going. Giving excellently. 
Verse 7 says this, But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all eagerness, and in the love from us that is in you, make sure that you excel in this act of kindness too. So I want to just remind you in my introduction, I mentioned that the Corinthian church looks incredible, does incredible things, seems very powerful, seems incredible. I said that word twice now. But they're not so good at the other stuff. So this is Paul actually being a little bit sarcastic. Like, if I was writing the, if I was like publishing a Bible, I would put the first part of verse seven in italics. It's like, well, if you're so good at all this stuff, like faith and your speech is amazing and you know so much and you're so eager and you've got great love, make sure that you also excel in this act of kindness too. And let me tell you, church, there are some churches in our country and in our partners to the South and elsewhere that could read this passage every day. We got mega churches, many of which are very generous, too many of which are very not. And may Christ repudiate them and bring them back to the heart of the gospel because they're missing it. And I, I, will, I will say that to their face. <laughs> And, you know, like, I'm, I'm trying to be generous as I can to people I don't know, but you don't have to look far to find your Kenneth Copelands, who bought himself another freaking jet, pardon me, um, and there are people in his community that are hungry. Bro, you don't need ten. Like, <laughs> anyways, disgusting. I, to borrow one of his own terms, I rebuke anyone like him. And if any ounce of this is hypocrisy in my own heart, God, I rebuke myself. But even as you do all the churchy things, church, make sure you excel in this act of kindness too. Oops, too far. Spoilers. Verse 8. I am not saying this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love by compassion with the eagerness of others. So, unfortunately, Paul's not pulling any punches here. He's saying, hey, you know your poor cousins to the north in Macedonia? Right? So Macedonia should ring some bells for some of you who are historians. Um, who's from Macedonia? Huh? Lydia, that's right. Outside of the Bible, though, who's from Macedonia? Oh, Alexander the, yeah, he's Macedonian, right? He was, he's dead now, but a um, <laughs> long time ago. Um, so the Roman Empire, when they were victorious over the Greeks, they made an example out of Macedonia. Like, it was like, there was no wealth there. There was no richness there. And yet the believers, who again, are the lowest of the low, right? Christianity grew through the efforts of the poor, from um, women who were wealthy, being able to lead Bible studies in their home or facilitate Bible studies in their home. The church grew from those who were weak, as Jesus said it would. The Macedonian church is being used as an example of Paul being like, these guys are broke, and look how much they gave. First Corinthian church, you don't impress me with, or Corinthian church, you don't impress me with your stuff, with your show, with your big building, with your great Easter place. I want you to be eager in your compassion and your giving. Christ giving is a part of Christian maturity, right? And again, I'm lumping in giving to your church with the other more spontaneous givings and other patterns of giving that you might have in your life. I have met people and I know people who say, oh, I don't give to the church, I give to these nonprofits instead. And I say, thank you for your gift to these nonprofits, but if you don't give to the church, we close. <laughs> I just gotta be honest with you. <laughs> we don't get money from anywhere else. I don't have a 401k that I'm reinvesting into the church. I don't even know if that's what 401ks do. That's just what came to mind, <laughs> right? If you want to partner with us because you believe in our vision and the impact we're having in our community, do it. If you don't, then don't give and maybe find a different church. 
And there's a lot of ways to give. I'm not telling you that you got to give me 500 bucks every Monday or else you're fired. Make it a thousand. Um, <laughs> sorry. But the truth is, and we're all, we're called Pathway Church Cambrian. And part of that is the beauty that we recognize that faith is a pathway, right? Some of us are near the start. Some of us are getting tired in the middle. Some of us are getting ready for the finish line. Right? And so I recognize that we're not all able or even desiring to give to the same extent. Let Christ do a work in you that he will bring to completion. But by using these examples, Paul is telling us that if you want to be a fully formed Christian, if you want to be doing what Christ desires you to do, giving is an irremovable part of that. Whether it's your tithe to the church, whether it's money to a man on the street who needs it, or a college that you support, or something like that, Christian college, you need to be considering that as part of your growth. I, I know of one family in our church who they would give their son a dollar in dimes, and they would tell him one of those dimes it goes to the church. And I've got the envelopes to prove it downstairs. What an incredible thing that was. Because they wanted their son to grow in faith into maturity. Got two more points for you. I need to, I need to hustle my bunnies here. Some of you have turkeys in the oven. <laughs> Second Corinthians verse seven or nine. We're going to skip some verses here. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you, you, by his poverty, could become rich. Now, we've, we've been talking about this the last two weeks, right? If you mass, let, missed the last two sermons, I recommend that you go back and watch them, because this subject has come in several times, right? We are a Christian church. There is the cross. We're a Baptist church, specifically. We have a cross in here. We don't have the fortune of having stained glass windows or anything like that, but if you were in a church that had them, you could look at them, and you could see the story of God becoming man— living, then dying unjustly for your sins, right? So when the Bible talks about Jesus becoming poor, they mean it both literally and metaphorically, right? Jesus was essentially not quite a homeless man. He probably, Mary probably would have taken him back in if he had to go home, but he gave up being God to a capacity, right, to become human, right? He did not equal, equate, qual, sorry, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, as we talked about last week, but made himself into nothing, right? Not completely. He didn't become less God, but his status did change. He transformed, right? I know it's weird, but we testify to its tr reality. <laughs> so that's this idea of him becoming poor. So he from a divine point of view, became poverty-stricken, and then from a real material point of view, he became poverty-stricken for you. So my point is, our giving is also meant to reflect gratitude. So for those of you in this room that, have, that are contending with the cross, meaning a man who did not deserve to die, died for me, means that I should be like him. Jesus, thank you for the cross. Now send me to do your work. Right? That's, that's the full swing of Christian maturity, right? The Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to keep my commandments and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that in a few weeks. If you have, as a believer, any sense of, I am so grateful for Jesus for saving me from my sin and from death, 
The answer is not to then just like sit waiting for the resurrection bus. Right? I mean, if all we're doing when we gather every single week is just waiting, I need to find a different job. But if instead we're ready to say, okay, Jesus, I, I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm trying to do the right thing. I've realized this world has nothing for me. So I, I, I want to I wanna grow. I want to be like you, Jesus. Then it needs to include giving. It needs to. For it is one of the essential ways that you show your gratitude. God has given me everything. So I'm ready to hold that everything with open hands. This is the caveat I wanted to bring you to, and the text brings us there by itself. Giving as you can. Verse 12 to 15 is what we'll be reading next. For if the eagerness is present, the gift itself is acceptable according to whatever one has not according to what he does not have. So again, even Paul the Apostle is saying, look, um, you're not supposed to give yourself into death or poverty, not financially anyways, but you are supposed to be eager. When I was, this is is just a confession, I guess, Um, when I was, um, you know, in college, I would attend a local church, and even for a couple years after, and if I forgot to go to the ATM on the way to church, I just didn't give that week. Honestly, I didn't learn a great pattern of giving until I was too old. Um, And I I regret that. Because I do think it was a sign of immaturity in the faith, not to have my business in order and to give where I was supposed to give. I mean, how many of us, when we're approached by a homeless person, just say, oh, I I can't give you my visa, I'm sorry. And then we just have a way to get out of the awkward conversation and move on. Sorry. (laughs) I mean, we live in 2024, so you can give online to these places. If someone asks you for food, you can buy them food. They might say no, and in that way, you have displayed wisdom in finding out what they're really looking for, because not everyone who asks you for money will use it for the right purposes. But maybe instead of just saying, no, I don't have any cash on me, you should pray and think about how you can still give in a way that's actually meaningful, a way that's gospel-oriented with that person, Be wise, be safe, but be eager. For I do not say this so that there would be relief for others and suffering for you, but as a matter of equality. So we're going to get a little spicy here. (laughs) Verse 14, at the present time, your abundance will meet their need, so that one day their abundance may also meet your need. And thus, there may be equality. Verse 15 will go on to say, As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. I want to park here as we wrap up our, service, or our sermon here. Your giving reflects Christ in your heart, church. Your giving is a means of lifting up others so that one day they will be able to lift you up. Paul recognizes here that while the, the, the Roman church was suffering and the Macedonian church and the Corinthian church were experiencing some degree of stability, that because of what the gospel demands, that stability is not guaranteed. 
And there's actually a really beautiful example of this that Pathway Cambrian was the recipient of, right? So many of you weren't here because this is before the COVID times, before the merger. <laughs> um, but Pathway Church helped to plant a church called Connect Church. And we sent people, and we sent $1,000 a month along with them, as well as helping to process their finances, right? And we planted them, and, and they've, they've, they've um, been successful in terms of growing as a church and, and preaching the gospel. And then two years ago, they came back and they wrote Pathway a check for $12,000. So they returned to us that offering. And let me tell you, in that situation, we really needed it. They didn't know that. I wasn't talking to my friend Dan, friends Dan and Amber every week about how finances were looking a little... <laughs> A little rough at that time. We had just come out of COVID. Pastor Jerry had resigned. Many people that were in the church had decided to move on or literally passed on. So our financial landscape had changed. And they wrote us a check for $12,000. We were able to have Eddie start his internship with us because of that money. And he's matured as a fantastic pastor and is continuing to. Right? So that's an example of this at work, right? That was a beautiful gift they gave us. It was encouraging to all of us, I'm sure. But they did it not to flex on us. They did it because they wanted to reflect what Jesus had done for them. I want to invite the worship team up. If you were in the business meeting a few weeks ago, you know that we're behind the eight ball a fair amount of money. Um, we are in a deficit and our savings are declining. Now the good news is, January is right around the corner, so we get to start from over again. <laughs> That's how it works, right, Larry? No, no okay. <laughs> The purpose of today's message is not to necessarily inspire you to make up our entire deficit in this moment. And I'll be honest with you, I was talking with one of my mentors about this because it, our deficit caused me, it's causing me a bit of anxiety, if I'm honest with you, right? As a human being, sometimes as a failing human being, you can make things about you that aren't really about you. Anyone can relate to that, amen? <laughs> And so when a pastor my age is faced with a church whose finances are declining, even though I would argue as a church we're thriving, we're having baptisms, our kids are learning the gospel, you know, we're growing as a church from where we were out of COVID. Things are great spiritually, financially, it's a little scary. And so, you know, you make it as a pastor about you, like, okay, should I cut my wages? Should I work 10 hours less a week? You go through all these things. You're talking with the finance team about what you should do. And so I said to my mentor, I just kind of vomited an email out to him, my mentor, Dr. Uh, David Lee. Um, and I said, unless a miracle happens, I don't know what we're going to do. And he said, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for the miracle first. <laughs> And we won't be the first church in history to run a deficit, not by a long shot. And the savings are okay. We're not going to close tomorrow or next week or six months from now. But honestly, six years, five years, four years, I don't know. So I'm talking out of a reality here, church, that is girded by a spiritual truth that we read this morning. I want to be realistic with you because you're adults. Well, mostly Theo's here, but um, Theo, let's get it. I'm going to stop talking because it's time for the Spirit to do its work. And I'm going to pray. And we're going to sing some songs. And I'm going to leave what I said with you. Because it's not my job to make this church live. But it is my job to tell you the truth. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, not all of us have a lot. Many of us would say we have a little. And yet, just as the widow brought what little she had, and it was praised as more than what others had given, we submit our giving and our church to your authority. Do not let this be about us, but rather be about what you have done in us. If you are calling us to give, let us give gladly. If we're feeling some resistance in our hearts this morning from this message, help us to process that in a way where we can return to a position of eagerness in how we give, and not just to the church, but to those in our world who need it. Help us to be more than just a church who talks a good talk, but help us to be a church that walks a good walk and that gives as you have given to us, Jesus. Today, our life is not being asked of us, but one day it will be. So let us prepare through our finances for a posture of radical giving so that when everything is demanded of us, we're able to say, by your will, God, and not our own. I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.